Perfect. So we're going to go ahead and get started to be respectful of everyone's time. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lauren Dennis, and I'm an account executive here with Salesforce within financial services and your hostess for this event. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for joining out of your busy schedules and your day as we uh, discuss how credit unions are gaining a competitive advantage in this fluid market. So without further ado, here to discuss whether they are thriving or surviving are our panelists and trailblazers. Brett, next slide, please. So we have John Sahagian, who is VP and Chief Data Officer at Baxter Credit Union. Alongside him, we have Chad Hassler, Manager of Digital Experience with Corning Credit Union. And last but not least, we have Desiree Wolf, who is our Senior Director and a Banking Industry Advisor with Salesforce. So Desiree, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much. Um, welcome everyone. I am really excited to have this conversation with you. And as someone who's been in the banking industry for over 20 years, I really know that our mission, delivering financial wellness to and services and health to our members is really key. And it, 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 it gets me going. And I know that's the same for my panelists as well. And the economic reality that credit unions are facing right now, I know everyone on this panel is dealing with this. We are facing what's looking to be the start of an inflationary trend. This is the first time in so long we've had our CPI index increase as much over 5% as happened in Q1 of this year. The treasury yield and the interest that we're able to give our members on their deposits and then also uh, drives our loan pricing, we are looking at a 2.9 10 year treasury yield. It would not surprise me if it goes over three, would not even surprise me if we have a period of an inverted yield curve. And as we know, the government is going to be addressing inflation by rising, increasing interest rates. It does also put a big pressure on financial service companies, banks, credit unions, who are going to be balancing that, in, uh, balancing that addressing of the inflation with concerns that it could push us into a recession. And as you know, you know, there's been a long period of strong deposit growth strong lending growth within credit unions, having a net worth ratio over 7%, 10% is amazing, um, and having a loan to share ratio of 70%. So that's where we are as credit unions. Um, let's talk about some of the trends that we are creating strategic direction to maximize. Next pillar. Branches, uh, the branch strategy, shifting branch strategies. I love to throw off some key ratios or statistics to show where the mindset is. And one of them is the view from credit union executives about branches. 61% say that they are necessary, but they are less important. There's 39% that feel they could not do and deliver their mission to their members without them. But there is also a growing percentage, 20, who are thinking that the less importance means that there will be less branches in different delivery methods. And add to that, that 89% of these same banking executives feel that FinTech partnerships are key to their branch strategy. So with that, I'd love to get our panelists into this dialogue around branch strategy and what they're experiencing. And I'd love to throw the first uh, question to Chad. Chad, how have you and your institution been addressing and evolving your branch strategy as it relates to expansion? Yeah, absolutely. So we, you kind of need to come back to what's the purpose of the branch? Why does the branch exist? The branch is just an extension of the business. It's a way to connect with a certain area of the membership. What area of the membership cares about coming to the branches versus doing things digitally or over the phone? Um, and what are they there to do? How much of that branch business is about, I've got 20 checks I need to deposit into six accounts, or I need you to, 
I have a, a large cash deposit that we need to break out and do something physical versus I need to be able to talk to someone. I have a situation I need to be able to, I need a trusted resource that I can talk with and figure out how to, how to move forward with this. Um, so we see the branch strategy uh, moving towards, you know, the, in, in our South Carolina market, for example, that, that's our, the latest market that we're entering. We looked at that and we're like, do we need to build a full service branch with a full service rep line down there? Or can we do this differently? Can we do effectively a micro branch, put a full service ATM in the office, put, uh, put a few offices in there with some financial services representatives that can open accounts, that can talk to you about loans, maybe talk to you about a mortgage. Um, and if you need to do something that's more transactional, can they speak to our digital platform or digital banking platform and help those members? You know, do you need to deposit a check? We can do that at the ATM or we can do that via mobile check deposit in our app. So our strategy with branches is definitely trended towards that micro branch strategy over the last few years. And, and I think we certainly see that continuing into the future. Chad, thank you for that. And there's something I'm gonna follow up on with, but before I do that, uh, John, um, any thoughts you'd like to share on branch strategy and thriving? You know, I, a lot of you know what we're how we're approaching this is very very similar to the way that 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 Brad and Corning is 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 approaching this. Um, just put a slightly different way, I think in in the past branches were so much about you know transactional activity within a community, and now we they, we've really seen them emerge as you know kind of brand visibility and recruiting really for for members and for leads and for 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 activity within that community. Um, but you know the other thing that that we saw really change within our branches is that you know rather than simply being a, a cost center for transactions within that community, we've also seen these folks that are that are working in branches, our, our sales and service agents, be able to do a lot more than they used to in the past. Everyone went home when COVID hit. You know even in our sixty plus branches, they you know all our branch employees went home, and it really helped for us to to understand that you know what so much of our member traffic that used to be branch centric, a lot of what they used to do transactional wise, they're doing in different channels now, but they're still coming to that branch when they wanna to talk to somebody. Um, so we have people that are there to talk to them when they need to talk to somebody, when they need some sort of you know, financial advice or they're looking to get into a mortgage. Um, but also those folks can help, they can help cover cues. They're, they're working, um, you know, cues of, of opportunities and leads that might originate from outside of the branch as well. So I think that was the other shift that we've seen in the last couple of years in our branches is that our branch employees are able to do more than just handle, you know, walk-in traffic. We also feel like, and we're hearing from branches that they feel because of some of the new kind of hybrid working environments that if you're in a branch that maybe is across the country from where our headquarters is, you used to feel like, oh my gosh, if I'm working in a branch, I'm kind of stuck to whatever that branch does. That's my trajectory in my career. And now they're really starting to see that, wait, no, I can actually, I can grow within this company in so many more ways outside of the branch than I used to. So those are, those are some of the, the, the shifts we've seen in, in the branches. So John, you, you raised some great points, you know, and, and there, and I'd love you to follow up. You can pick which one you'd like to follow up on. I was intrigued by your positioning of branches as from a brand perspective, not just a transactional center. And then also when you went into the converse, your, your insights around the workers and what the branch and the enabling of the branch as a result of the pandemic uh, to support bankers, um, being in multiple locations and multiple channels. Um, and that being something that you've seen as I would even, I in, would take as a retention or a workplace benefit in enabling that hybrid uh, ability for bankers. So I would love your thoughts on how you saw the pandemic and the changes that were made to support branches as part of the pandemic, enabling what insights you've seen right now? Well, our launching of Salesforce actually uh, coincided with the, the, the pandemic. So I kind of, some of the, what, what the force was in kind of moving and changing behavior, whether it was Salesforce, it was, you know, some of it was COVID. I think a, a lot of it was just a really 
great opportunity that emerged because those two things happened at the same time. Um, but our employees, I, I think in the past, there were so many, I mean, we, we, I think we're all in this, where we manage and juggle so many different backend systems, whether it's, you know, a different application for the phone system, a different application for debit, and for credit, and for mortgage, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we really have worked hard in trying to kind of distill all those interfaces down into Salesforce, which has given us the opportunity in the branches to say, I know that some of these other things might have seemed out of reach for you in the past because you didn't want to, you know, it was too much to be trained on these five additional systems in addition to managing cash, a cash drawer and everything else. Um, so we really felt like by consolidating a lot of that down, the branch employee was able to say, well, wait a minute, I'm way more versatile and I can be way more versatile than I was before because I have insight into you know, what's going on with a mortgage application. That's a good example of something that happens in the branch a lot where they'll, they'll come into the branch and they'll say, hey, by the way, where's my mortgage application at? You know, I, I, I filled it out online over the weekend. I talked to so-and-so on the phone. Where is it at? And in the past, they'd be like, you know what? I'll have someone give you a call. I, 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 I don't know. Uh, they didn't put notes in scimitar, right? Uh, and now they're able to pull up that, that same opportunity, right? Within the same window that they're working to help that member with a service request and say, well, oh, okay, I, I can see where it's at. You know, here's the status on it. Here's the stage that it's at. Here's what you should expect. Um, so it, it, we found that um, whether they're a branch employee that's on the phone talking to somebody or there's somebody that's there in person, they're able to handle so much more. So we're also seeing a lot of those employees say, well, wait a minute, I, I'm kind of interested in mortgages. I might want to you know, start to learn more about becoming part of the mortgage servicing department or become part of the loan team um, for sales. So you know, we've really seen everybody's, not just our thoughts in terms of, of leadership or management in terms of what branches can be, but branch employees themselves have really started to see it as it's not a dead end kind of job where you're only stuck. You, there's a lot of things you can branch into because we have the technology to do it. And I think that the, the pandemic really helped, helped all of us kind of understand what technology is really capable of doing. In the branches, John, that's great. Chad, I don't know if you wanted to add on to that. Um, and if you did, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And I'd also like to follow up with you about something you said earlier in your response about branches, so. Yeah, for sure. I mean, just generally the pandemic, it just it just condensed a, a whole a whole chunk of time that would have, you know, how long would it have taken? How many of you do curbside pickup for groceries now purely because you prefer it, right? Or curbside pickup for anything. You know, you can curbside pick up crickets at Petco if you have a reptile at home. Like you can curbside pick up anything now if that, if you told someone that in 2019, they would have been like, what? All those, those retail stores didn't have that infrastructure to do that then. And the pandemic condensed that, right? It, it just, and it, it, it condensed the infrastructure for these, these retailers to be able to do that function and the consumer expectation around those things. How has that affected credit unions? You know, for us, we, we had, uh, we're, we're a little earlier than, than John with the, uh, with, with our Salesforce adoption, we're, we're still early on that runway, but uh, we had just prior to the pandemic had done our digital banking conversion. And thank goodness we did, because if we didn't, you know, our old on-site digital banking uh, a server that sat in the data center would have just melted into a puddle of molten metal and fallen through the floor and hit somebody in the call center, right? It would have been terrible. But we were set up on the platform and we had the infrastructure so that when, when the pandemic hit and our digital banking logins went through the roof because it was the only way you could interact with your financial institution, we were able to, to weather that. And now we see those consumer expectations changing and how really digital, you know, we, I, I, think, of, I think of everything that, that I do in my world, my, my title's digital experience, but really all we are is a reflection of what the business does in a digital form. And that might be how we present it to the members. There's a digital representation of Corning Credit Union to the member, and there's a digital representation to the team members, as John was talking about. How do you, you know, it, it, when, if you've ever gone grocery shopping and you make a list, you know, if, you, if your brain was really, really intelligent, if you really had awesome intelligence, you would look at the tinfoil that you knew you needed to get and you'd pick it up off the shelf and put it in your cart and go buy it. But the reason we have to make lists is that our brains don't work that way. We don't look at the tinfoil and think, 
oh, I need that. We walk by the tinfoil and then five miles down the road, we're like, oh, I forgot the tinfoil. I need to see information at the right time. And that's what we're seeing now with Salesforce is that I have the member in front of me or I have them on the phone with me or I'm, I'm chatting with them in a live chat. I need to see the full context of this member's relationship right now. I don't want to go to you know 15 different systems to put that story together. I need the context of where that member is, what is the, the temperature and the actions of that member's relationship with Corning Credit Union right now. And if I have that information, how much better am I able to serve that member's needs and, and deliver you know, just sup superior service? I think about it this way, like I absolutely agree with the second bullet there about you know uh, fintech partnerships being key. And I see a lot of stuff with fintechs and it's, it's intimidating for we credit unions sometime because we're coming from this traditional space and we see that you know there's apps out there that can monitor your spending patterns and know that you walk into the grocery store on Tuesdays and you usually spend $350. And if you don't have enough money, the FinTech app's gonna just lend you the money on demand. And you look at it from a credit union perspective, you're like, how are we ever going to compete with that? But the thing that credit unions do that all those FinTechs can't do is it's the relationship, it's the service. If you ever think back to a moment in your life where you experience stress or a crisis, how, how many people go to a piece of technology to feel less stressed out? Does anyone have that happen? We don't do that. When we want to de-stress, we go to the people, we go to our, our loved ones, our spouses, our friends. Those are the relationships are the things that we come back to. And that's the advantage that, that credit unions have. So from you know the pandemic to the branch strategy, Everything that we do is really just down to the relationship with the member. And all we're trying to do is extend that and, and just put our chips on that part of the of the table. That's that's where it matters. Absolutely. And Chad, thank you. You actually uh, in following up on in the impact and the escalation of the branch experience because of the pandemic really addressed a point I wanted you to follow up on, which you did great, which is, you know, the purpose of the branch. You, when, and that you, it really is for credit unions, it is delivering what the credit union's mission is, however the customer wants to experience it. And that when you talked about how your role as the digital officer is to be able to deliver that digitally, you, you address the, the purpose of branches because it's really a branch is just one of the many channels that credit unions are using to meet their members' services. So thank you for that. And I think it's actually a great segue, segue into our next banking imperative trend, which is membership. Uh, so within credit unions, membership uh, is, is key. Uh, one of the things that's impactful that we're really at that kind of inflection point, I won't say tipping point, but inflection point, is that you know, it is very clear that our members are going to have multiple relationships. Historically, we were used to them having multiple relationships with banks as well as us. But now with fintechs coming and snipping at pieces of the experience, you know, it, I, I found this stat from the American banker really key, which is by 2025, 20% of the U.S. population will hold an account at a non-bank, and that includes credit unions. Um, and then the other thing, which was in the NCUA strategic plan for this year and the next three years, was that you know we there's been a decline in CU member satisfaction, and I like to caveat this. Member satisfaction is like 75%. That's great. Um, but Chad, you mentioned it earlier. CU's credit unions deliver that sense of security, comfort to members. And to have over the last couple of years, that satisfaction score decline, I do think is a bit of a canary in the coal mine from the perspective of what it means for credit unions to know that they are communicating their competitive advantage to their membership, uh, especially as this year, as it's been measured by the NCUA, the customer satisfaction actually got lower than what customers feel towards their banks. Again, also high, 
But still, it's one of those things that I, I would love your thoughts, and I'll start with you, Chad, about membership growth and addressing the changing dynamics within the demographic, customer preference with technology and non-banks. Your thoughts. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of things there. Um, the 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 first thing, and and those of you that are, are are joining us today, you may experience this at your own institution. I think being able to connect with anything, meaning you know our credit union, according credit union, your credit union, being able to connect with anything, any entity, any fintech, any app, I think is probably like it sounds daunting, but if you can't, so. Think about back during the pandemic, because this happened a lot with us, how many people were starting Robinhood accounts, Coinbase accounts, uh, different investment accounts, and they want to connect your digital banking platform to that app. They want to fund their account and they can't, or if they can, they have to do it with a routing number and, and a routing and transit number and the account number. And they've got to wait three days for that to happen versus they can just go to this app and, you know, Oh, this other uh, bank or, or credit union, and it connects right away, and that will sway people's decisions on where they where they put their money and where they where their trust is. You know, it, it's not like it's just a neighborhood credit union nowadays, and, and you you go down there and you, you talk to the loan officer and you get your loan, and that's your only option. You have every option. You can go anywhere, and so I, I still want my hub. I want that relationship. I want that 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 home, that trust. But if that thing can't connect with my stuff, which is like my Starbucks app or my Dunkin' Donuts app or whatever stores I visit or you know whatever other credit card I'm using with the points that I want to redeem and all, if it can't connect, how many of you, if you rented a car, okay, nowadays if you got in a car and it didn't have Apple CarPlay or it didn't have Android Auto or, or if it didn't have that experience and you got in the rental car, how mad are you? But four years ago, if that didn't happen, you're like, well, it's a rental car. Like, you know, it's, I can't expect that. Now you demand it. And if it doesn't connect to your stuff, to your world, you're not, you're, you're just, you're not interested. Even if it's the greatest car ever, it, if it doesn't have that thing, if it doesn't connect to you, you're not going to use it. I think that credit unions are in that same space. We have to be, and this is why Salesforce is so important to the to the future because you need that platform strategy. You need to be able to connect all of your disparate, you know, hundreds of internal systems into one pane of glass, and then your member needs to have that same experience. The the for example, one of the things that we're we're working on now, this is where our digital experience and our Salesforce experience overlap. We're building a dispute uh, process within Salesforce. We're building a team experience workflow and a member experience workflow. We're going to surface that member experience workflow in digital banking. So when you are scrolling through your list of transactions, you tap on a transaction, you say, I need help with this transaction, and it launches a Salesforce experience for that member, provisions them just in time. There's a bunch of jargon in there, technical stuff. The point is the member doesn't know it's Salesforce. The member doesn't know it's our digital banking platform. They just know it's Corning Credit Union. And it, it's so that's the idea is that you're trying to take all this disparate stuff, blend it into a single pane of glass. And that is the representation to your members of, of your brand back to the things that John was saying before. I hope I answered your question there. Fabulously. Um, John, is there anything you wanted to add? No, I, you know, Chad painted a <clears throat> very important picture for us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, one of the things that keeps jumping out in my mind is um, in, in terms of people moving towards digital channels for, for financial institutions. And for us, I know that um, we, when we look at the stats, 98% of interactions that we have with members are done in a no touch, you know, like self-help kind of way. They don't, they don't come into contact with a, a BCU employee. Um, you know, so that's something that constantly sticks out in, in my mind is, okay, even our branch employees use our digital channels a lot. And they like to use, they, they're not a, a one or a two channel um, a type of member, more and more and more. Most of our members now are multi-channel members, getting back to Chad's point about really pulling together all those experiences into one credit union experience and, and keeping that relationship tight with the credit union. Because as Chad points out, no one cares what system you're using 
to, to do this or to do that. And they're certainly not going to be willing to sign into multiple systems to do the same thing with you because in their mind, you have one relationship. That's my relationship with my credit union. I don't care how many relationships you have in the background to make that possible. Um, so, but with that said, I think one of the things that we're talking a lot about at, at BCU these days is the fact that, you know, have we, has it gotten through our heads yet that we are a digital experience company? You know, we still like to think of ourselves as we're in financial services, we, we buy and sell money, you know, essentially. And it's like, no, we're a digital experience company at this point. And if we are going to keep pace with, you know, some of the larger institutions that have you know, uh, R&D budgets that are larger than some of the asset sizes of a lot of credit unions, um, we're going to have to take a different approach. And I think that for, for BCU, it, you know, in order to continue to grow in this environment, you know, we really, we, we believe very much so in the power of, of our purpose. You know, I think Chad did a good job talking about relationships and the importance of that. And I think that that's kind of an offshoot of what we feel like our purpose is and why we're here as, an, as, a, as a financial not-for-profit. And we believe that that purpose, if done right, can really resonate with members and give us a competitive advantage. And even in some cases, I feel like our size and our agility can give us a, a real advantage over some of those organizations. When I, we've brought in employees from other companies, um, much, much larger financial institutions, and they come in and they're like, well, you guys don't have the pockets that we had, but wow, you, you, you're able to really get things done quickly. And I think that that's a really, really important uh, thing for us to keep in mind. Um, so we really, just one last point is, you know, as we kind of get that through our heads, we are a digital experience company. Um, over the last few years, we've been trying to figure out, okay, what are the competencies we really need to succeed? And there are four things that are, that are top of mind for me. Um, one is, that the, you know, the product, our product which used to be a, you know, whatever, a checking account with a, a series of, of enhancements and a rate and a, you know, whatever. It's like the product is the experience now, right? So we need to get better at, at how we develop and how we <clears throat> build better experiences through UI, UX design, through journey building and lead management and these sorts of things that we haven't been good at in the past. Um, Chad talked about the second thing, which is really unifying the experience, not only from the perspective of the, the members, we've done that really well in the past where we kind of, we, we slap lipstick on it and we're like, yep, here it is. It's all one pane of glass. But in the background, our employees are pulling their hair out because they're, they're juggling between 15 different systems. We got to improve that too, if we expect them to provide a great experience. Um, and then the last two things for us, one is, is uh, and I got to say this as a chief data officer, um, that, you know, data, we need to manage data like a true asset at BCU because all our digital aims and aspirations, they're all very, very dependent on how much do we trust our data and how well can we connect our data. Um, so that's critical. And the last thing, and, and maybe one of the harder things, how do we build the speed and the alignment of innovation across the credit union so that we can keep up with what our members want? You know, because that's changing every, so if you're, if you're putting a three-year plan out there for, for your innovation, um, you, how, I would ask you, how do you have any clue what people are going to be looking for in three, three years out? That's a really long horizon these days. So how can we be fast, agile, without completely losing alignment across the organization? Um, so that's something that we're really focusing on right now is, is an agile transformation, um, but also we're really shifting to more of a business-led um, development organization where decision making and actually development itself around digital experiences is not just happening in IT or, or in our, 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 our PMO. It's happening um, and nestled inside of the business where they're there working with our members every day. They know what the needs are. They know where the gaps are. And they're the ones that are driving development um, today at BCU. So again, like Chad, I'll say that you know th that's a mouthful. Um, but those are the things that we're focusing on to make sure we can continue to grow in this crazy new world we're in. Absolutely. Hey, Desiree, sorry, we have a question from the participants. So I think it's timely for, for the topics that John and Chad were just speaking to. So the, the question is really around for those that are just starting out. So for any credit unions who are really trying to figure out what their digital footprint looks like, 
Is there any particular advice that either of our panelists would have for someone who's just embarking on this? Obviously, both these organizations have, have gotten further in the life cycle, but any, any advice for those that are just kind of starting that process? Sure, uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, for, for us, uh, if I if I was if I was advising ourselves and seeing what, kind of what we've done over the last couple of years, you know, starting small has probably been our the the, the thing that's allowed us to 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 step into it. You know, you kind of have to dip your toe in the water. So an example of that for us, um, it, this is more on the Salesforce side, but we've done this with some fintech relationships as well. How can you start something that is going to be transformational ultimately for the business, but not do it? to the entire business and your entire membership and your reputation and all that stuff, putting all that at risk at once and some big overhaul is, is really risky. We, we had to do that during our, our digital banking uh, conversion. We, you know, we had to basically convert our membership uh, you know, and have them re-register for digital banking. Talk, and we couldn't tell them when we were gonna do it because it would have destroyed the infrastructure if everybody tried to hit it at once. That's, it took a ton of time and a ton of preparation to get the whole company involved not efficient. And it's, you know, we're in a better place now, but like, if you can do it in a way where you don't have to do that, that that's preferred. So how do you start small um, with, with Salesforce, for example, getting Salesforce into your organization is a tremendous undertaking. It's a platform. It's not a product where it's, it's like years ago, you know, banks and credit unions at one point way back before probably any of us were born did everything on paper. I don't know how far back that was, but right. There was no computer. It was all done on paper, right? And then one day, a bank or a credit union got a computer and they're like, wow, this thing's really great. We should get more of these. And then they got 10 and then they got 15 and it grew and grew and grew. And then it's like, oh, hey, there's a server now and it can do this. And there's this application. And we just built on top of this monolith forever. And we have this big arduous system that we're, you know, that we're now trying to manage and turn back into a single pane of glass, which is, which is not, not easy. Um, how do you how do you do that? How do you uh, how do you start that step? So, with Salesforce, we're not going to do this overnight. We can't do the entire organization overnight, and we can't do it for all of our membership at once. There's 140,000 members. We can't train the team like this too much. So, with our what we had the opportunity to expand into the South Carolina market, um, we knew we were going to be expanding into that market, and we're like, can we start our Salesforce journey? just in South Carolina, separate website, separate, uh, same, same brand, it's still Corning Credit Union, but you know, a, a subdomain website, you know, sc.corningcu.org. Let's show them that you know, Corning Credit Union in South Carolina, and let's build a Salesforce experience to serve those members because there's no risk there. They don't know who we are. They have no idea that Corning Credit Union, 140,000 members and all this history and you know, all that, they don't know any of that. They just see Corning Credit Union, and they want to interact with it. Let's it give it gave us permission to try stuff. John was talking about, you know, adopting that agile methodology, and that is something that's absolutely happening in our organization. Um, you know, uh, Tom and our in our PMO office has been has been uh, critical in that effort in getting the company company to think instead of trying to build the most perfect thing ever and roll it out perfectly. We we, we always tend to hire a lot of detail oriented people at financial institutions, right? Dotting the I's, crossing the T's, we gotta make sure everything's perfect. And we never start because of that. And so this is the opposite. It's like, let's start, let's build a skateboard. I know you want a Ferrari, me too. Let's start with a skateboard. Then we'll turn it into a scooter. Then we'll turn it into a bicycle. Then maybe we can put four wheels on it and make it a car and, and eventually get there. But if we can do that where we're introducing this, the, the scooter to, or the skateboard to five members in South Carolina on day one, and then let it grow and iterate on it, get the feedback. How can we make this better? Um, so, so I know that that is not a specific answer for each credit union and how you do it. But if you can just try to remember to start small in a low risk way, if, you, if, you, if there's an opportunity to do that, that's where you learn all the stuff. We spent a year developing our Salesforce, uh, uh, different applications that we built on the Salesforce platform that we knew we were building for the entire team to use but it was only meant to serve South Carolina to start. And we needed that small kind of goal to shoot at because otherwise it's like, how do you eat an elephant? I don't know, like we, let's, let's pick the toe, let's start there, right? Like that's, that's, that's kind of the approach that we, that we took. 
Chad, thank you so much for that. You know, I, the, my nuggets that I got from that was definitely starting small, finding something where you can have a great impact, but not as big a risk. That's wonderful. John. I, Chad said it really well. Um, it, I think it's cruel, by the way, to talk about elephant toes when everybody, this is over lunch and everybody's hungry already, Chad. So. <laughs> sorry, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> you won't forget it, okay? How about that? <laughs> that's true. Yeah, crickets and elephant toes. That's That's what I'm coming away with. Um, you know, I, I think he said it really, really well, start small, but dream big. You got to know where, where you're ultimately heading. Um, and, but most of all, make sure to get started because there is some urgency to this. The, the only thing I would add to that, quite frankly, is, um, don't underestimate either as, especially if this is something that's a, a you know, a large change at your organization, don't underestimate the, the cultural impact that this has. People get very fixed in their ways of thinking and how they approach their business and how they even approach their technology. Um, and every, even, even I think we've done a great job and we've come a long way down the road, but still now we still deal with constantly, um, you know, some reverberation through our uh, 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 culture. And it, it's something that we're constantly having to, to work through. So just making sure your change management is, is in place and functioning is really, really important. John, thank you for those add-ons. You know the you know the urgency and in making time for the internal cultural impact. I think those are keys to success. Um, if our panelists are ready, let's move on to the last uh, imperative pillar, which is financial wellness and technology. And one of the things that I found interesting in this imperative was the not the fact that twenty nine percent of 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 our members don't look to us or think we'll provide them with financial wellness, that number has declined. It used to be 45% two years ago. Um, and the fact that, and this is something that, you know, there's a lot of interconnectedness between these pillars. So that, you know, the, the expectation of a seamless omni-channel experience could have been quite frankly at anyone. And we've talked about them, but the expectation, and you know, I think Chad said it when we started off, Consumers are expecting that experience everywhere. The Amazon effect is now a reality. It is table stakes. So I'm interested, um, Chad, if you wanted to talk about, you know, financial wellness, which for credit unions and, 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 and delivering value to our members, that's key. So, you know, what, what does it mean for your credit union imperative or strategy that our members are looking or expecting that from us less and less. Yeah, it's it's. I, I think it's a reflection of how we have operated historically. You know, the, the world is moving as fast as it's moving, and and I think we we as an industry we always tend to lag behind. You know, it, we, we how how many of your organizations have had to you know again back to that whole perfection thing. We want to have you know, the, the perfect paper, perfect credit scores, no risk on these things. We don't want any delinquencies. And so we, we, we're very, we're tough. We're, we're, we, we scrutinize very heavily who we lend to. And now you've got, you know, FinTech apps out there that will, you know, will consider those things. It's like, oh, you're a small business owner. Your business doesn't have a credit score. Let's look at who you are. And we'll, we'll, we'll make that, you know, they, they'll make that work. And we've still got some institutions out there who are kind of holding firm to those traditional, uh, you know, sort of principles. So, so trusting a, why would you trust that organization with your, with your financial wellness if that organization isn't willing to listen to you or to hear and understand you and your story? Um, and I think in some ways we can do that, but it's not, it's not easily surfaced to people, especially when they spend all day long looking down at their screen. That's hard to do for credit unions. We can do that face to face, but if you don't come in, how do you know that we can work with you? And how, how do we build that relationship? So I see that as really just a reflection of, of the state of the industry and, and, and the, 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 the absolute you know, bellwether we have, to, we, we have to change. We have to adapt and it gets to the second point, being able to connect to everything and being able to, to just to keep up with the, that pace of change that's happening everywhere else. Otherwise we are absolutely gonna be left behind. John. What thoughts do you have on this? So uh, just to, to build on what Chad was saying, I think, you know, when, when 
if you ask the average person, you know, is, is, is the banking industry about making money or is it about, you know, helping people and about, you know, creating financial wellness? I think most people would probably, you know, be more of the cynic in them and say, no, but they're about maximizing yield and margin and fee, you know, income and all that kind of stuff. And uh, my financial wellness might be in direct conflict, you know, with what their primary aims are. Um, especially with credit unions, I feel like we, we have, you know, always, I think, risen above that, you know, partly because the way that we're, we're, we're formed as a not-for-profit, um, but also going back to one of, one of Chad's great points was, um, you know, you had that trust that, no, I really do believe that BCU or Corning or whomever it is has my best interests at heart. But the way that they knew that is because they would go into the branch and they would talk to Desiree at the branch and like, oh yeah, no, Desiree knows, you know, that uh, I have a, a, a pair of twins who, who, who play soccer and, and, you know, we've shared lunch together, you know, down the block or whatever. We have a personal relationship. I trust that she has my best interest in mind. Um, and with branches changing and shifting in terms of their purpose and more and more of my activity and interactions with my credit union being digital, um, some of that can get eroded, but we have to, especially by leveraging data, we have to find um, more sophisticated ways to better understand who our members are, what their needs are, where they're in, what's the context of their life as the data tells it to us, so that we can start to show them through a more digital fashion that we know who they are and we know what they need and we're here to make them better. Our, our purpose statement at BCU is to empower people to discover financial freedom. Um, and you know, it's really incumbent upon us to you know, help our members really understand and know that um, is, is the case. And that really is our purpose and really what we believe. Um, and by the same token, we need to make sure that that's not just you know, marketing or, or PR or lip service. That's gotta be true. You know, we've gotta step back and say, if we want our members to believe in our purpose, you know, um, how, how do we show ourselves that, we are, that we're serious about this? You know, are we measuring the investments we're making into well-being, you know, into members' you know, well-being? Are we measuring you know, different initiatives and strategies? And you know, are we looking at every decision we're making across our credit union and looking at it through the lens of well-being? You know, if we are, then we're probably rising to that, to that challenge and to that, that, that mission and that purpose. And our members will know because it'll be evident in the things that we develop. It'll be evident in the experiences we create and the journeys that we manage for our members. Um, and of course, if you should go into a branch and need to talk to somebody face to face, you're going to know it from them as well. So I, I really think that uh, we need to, going back to kind of hammer on that point that Chad, Chad made, I think we need to better understand our members, and that needs to be reflected in the experience that they're getting from us, because quite frankly, they're getting that experience from other aspects of their life, you know, whether it's, you know, their, their Netflix queue or, you know, recommendations being made when they go to the, you know, uh, Amazon for crickets, you know, or whatever it might be. Other companies are figuring out ways to better know their customers. Um, we need to be able to do that same thing for our members. John, thank you for that. And, you know, you know, during this conversation I've had, I, and, and I have to believe our participants are coming away with the, I feel like it's more of a paradigm shift. I will say as someone who's been in technology and financial services, there is that whole element of the Amazon effect has caught us from behind and we're scrambling to catch up. But, you know, in this last 40 minutes, you know, Chad and John, you've, you've shown from your leadership positions within your credit unions, how it is our mandate and our ability to create those connected experiences, to make sure that things connect for our members, to know them using data, managing that, and that we are able to do that in a way that is bringing value and delivering an our distinct advantage. And so this last these last 40 minutes have really surfaced so many great nuggets of action items that I hope all the participants take away, delivering on that 360 view of our customers, of our members, and in a way, for, whether it's in our banking centers, for our members, shared experiences, being able to empower financial health for our members and using technology to do that. 
I, I, I want to say uh, that Chad and John, this has been a fabulous conversation. I'm inspired. I can't wait to go back and, and deliver more services and solutions for our credit union members. And with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. Let's see. We have 10 minutes. I've got a couple, Desiree, that, that are coming in here through the chat. So um, and I think they're they're pretty you know timely again for some of the conversations we've had today. So kind of speaking to, and I think both Chad and John have spoke to what the roadmap looks like for, for their respective credit unions. I think some of the participants would like to understand what's on their roadmap next. You know, they, they've got a platform already built with Salesforce. What's next on the roadmap? And then, you know, how do you get the individual stakeholders engaged at the respective credit unions to further those initiatives? We know this is not, you know, one person making the decision in most institutions. So how do you engage those stakeholders when you have something on the roadmap you want to advance? Chad, did you want to go first? Sure. Um, it, it, it That is not easy. Uh, <laughs> sometimes to getting your, remember, it, you've got your traditional business and we're, we're sometimes we have to, yeah, come on, we want, we, it's over here. Do you see it yet? And, and you got to remember with the, with those stakeholders, especially if they're not, if you're on this call, likely you're plugged in to the digital world, right? You're, you're, you're plugged into all the stuff, you're paying attention to it. But if you've been working in lending for the past 20 years, or you've been working in, an, in, in a traditional uh, leg of the business for a long time, your, your business has been busy and you're, you don't have this, you're not looking at it through the same lens. So, you know, I, I just had a, a conversation this morning with, with, one of, uh, with one of my employees, Jennifer, about, you know, uh, there's a, a particular element of our digital experience that, you know, we had an old way we were doing pre-approval campaigns and we have this new thing that we've already purchased and we're using for a certain segment of, of getting offers out to people based on credit score and that kind of thing. But we haven't yet pulled that data to do the campaigns digitally. It's like, so basically point being that the business has had a very traditional way of, of going out and finding uh, leads for a pre-approval pre campaign and sending stuff out and they're sending them out to our our uh, you know loan origination system you know that that sort of canned experience that we've had for a long time, which is fine. But when you compare that to the modern experience that you can have today in these apps, it just it doesn't it doesn't stand up. And there's no reason not to use the new system other than that the the lending team may not be aware of it. And even if they are aware of it, how many of you as I think it was Allison or someone had said right from the beginning, maybe it was Desiree that you're coming from a back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meeting. We're all in back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meetings all the time. And you've got all that, that churn and stuff you've got to work through. So I guess the thing I would say is that it, before you can, it's not about having some fancy message. You're not going to say words in a specific way that's just going to magically unlock your leadership team, stakeholders in the business are like, oh, we're totally in on digital now because you said it just that way. It's not how it works. It is about relate. It's the same thing it is to your members. It's the relationships with those areas of the business. Are you working with your lending teams? Are you are you sitting down and talking to the different stakeholders in the business about their current problems? Do you know them? Is there a, a relationship with them? Because if there's a relationship with them, you're 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 a little more likely to listen. You know, if your if your spouse gives you some feedback on something they liked or didn't like, you at least hopefully take it a little more seriously than you would if a complete stranger walked up to you and said the same thing. And the reason is the relationship. It's the same thing for the members. So there's no magic formula to getting your stakeholders on board. There's certain, it's also important not to overwhelm them because it's already daunting for us. I feel daunted by the challenge and I live this every day. I can't imagine if I'm, you know, if I'm in a branch and I'm just talking to members and then I say, this digital thing is going to change everything. It just you'll 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 lose people. So it's the same thing. You have to start small, really leverage the relationship. Um, you if you don't have someone in your digital space that can communicate to the non-technical, that is the position that you need to fill. You need a communicator in there because this is all down uh, to communication. Um, there's a great quote, um, and I can't remember who said it, so I'm sorry I can't credit them, but it's communication is what the listener does. And it gets back to that same point. It doesn't, I know, believe me, I know I sound good right now. I know this microphone's not cheap, but it doesn't matter how good I sound. 
if you don't hear, if it didn't go in and process and get understood, no communication happened. And it's the same way with your stakeholders and your leadership team. You have to have that relationship and those communication channels have to be open. So that's, that's the way I would approach it. Chad, thanks for that. I, I got it. You know, relationship with your stakeholders, same as your members, you know, don't overwhelm and communicate. And that's what matters what happens to the, to the listener. John, what are your thoughts? So I'll just share, I'll, I'll take a literal approach to the, the question about what's, what's on your roadmap. Um, so what, what we're going through might be very specific to us, but I, I think it, it could be relevant for others. Um, we historically have been a, an organization that you know, stands up, you know, we have these big enterprise projects that are driven by IT. You know, there's three or four of them in a year and you, know, you wanna get something done, you're planning out months, if not years in advance to get even little things kind of created because all the resources are soaked up um, and, and everything is very much top down kind of decided in terms of where development and IT development um, uh, happens. So we've really, we're really right now going through a transformation. I, I mentioned about Agile and that that's part of it, but the bigger part of it really is taking to the decision-making around where we invest in technology development and placing it into the business. So um, we're standing up, instead of standing up, you know, eight scrum teams inside of the PMO, we are standing up eight scrum teams and those teams live and are directed by the business. So we have a lending value stream and we have a, a uh, deposit operations lending stream. We have two Salesforce scrum teams. We have a data value stream. And what we're really excited about what this is doing for us is a couple things. One is, like I said before, and this actually kind of goes to what Chad was talking about too. It's putting these decisions about where we invest in our organization and it's putting it into the hands of the actual business owners, the people that the, the lenders and the folks that the service uh, folks and saying here, you know, where we need to make the most progress. You know, we want to measure it. We want to, we, you got to understand, you know, the impact you're having, you got to understand why we're doing this and prioritizing things a certain way, but that's your decision. Cause you lead, um, you know, let's say lending or, or mortgage lending. So the mortgage lending, you know, uh, head of mortgage lending is responsible for how they develop their pro product, which is not just the mortgages that they offer, but the experience around the, the mortgages as well. Um, so this is a this is a massive shift for us um, in terms of how we approach development and innovation. But we're really, really excited by the results and the, the speed that we're starting to see um, across the organization. Um, we're also really doing uh, a lot in terms of understanding the, uh, these, all the work and all the investment that's happening. Well, what is the value that we're getting out of it? You know, so all those little iterative changes and improvements we're making across all these value streams, you've got to be able to articulate um, in a consistent way the value that's created there. So you might think that, well, how do you justify you know, a, a second Salesforce team? And, and the answer is quite simple. It's like, well, because when you look at each of those teams and what they're actually delivering and how we're measuring value that they're creating, it more than pays for the team. Um, and and that's, that's how we're, we're approaching development and, and quicker innovation at BC moving forward. And I think it's early, early on, we're only about a year into this year and a half. And we're really, really encouraged by what we're seeing. John, thank you so much for sharing that, sharing your roadmap components and your evolution from three to four big, hairy things to having eight teams living within the business. Um, that was very valuable. Um, I have to say, I'm a little sad that it is 1259. Um, um, I, I, I would like to start off by thanking Chad and John again for sharing their valuable insights from the trenches. And I would say definitely giving proof points that competitive union, that credit unions are competitively thriving and not stagnating. And so on behalf of my partners at Salesforce, Lauren Allison, Brian Brett at Zenify, thank you. And thank you to all of our participants in today's webinar. Thanks, it was a pleasure. Pleasure, thanks guys. Thank you so much.